this is Dr. Burns. We're just getting started inside a uh, shoulder arthroscopy. We're going to take a full diagnostic arthroscopy of the shoulder. The patient's on their side. The ball of the ball and socket, the humeral head is up above. The glenoid, or the socket, is down below. This structure right here is the first step in our diagnostic arthroscopy, which is the long head of the biceps tendon. We can pull that down and into the shoulder and take a picture of that. It looks quite good. There's no signs of significant damage. There's a little bit of redness on the top side, a little bit of inflammation, but no tearing. The biceps inserts onto the superior labrum. The labrum is a ring of cartilage that runs around the socket circumferentially. This is the labrum here, and the very top of the labrum right here is where the biceps inserts. We always pull the biceps back a little bit. We see a little cracking there, but that's a normal variant for people's shoulders. If you tear this off, we call that a slap tear, a superior labral, anterior to posterior tear. We'll come around the posterior aspect of the labrum here, and we'll look at its connection to, this, to the glenoid. And that looks quite good. As people get older, the labrum can degenerate and get a bit torn down there. Inferiorly down here, that is the inferior glenohumeral ligaments near the armpit. Those can be torn as well, but they're intact in this case. We'll look down and inspect the glenoid itself for signs of cartilage damage, arthritis, or bone loss. This glenoid is well maintained. No signs of significant arthritis. Then we'll come up and we'll look at the undersurface of the rotator cuff, which are a group of tendons that come from the left side of the screen up to the superior aspect of the shoulder up in here. We'll look for a full thickness tear, partial thickness tear, and the like. In this patient, there's a little partial thickness tearing. You see little frayed ends of the tendon there, but we don't see a full thickness hole. We'll debride that back and establish how much intact fibers are present as compared to how many of the fibers or how much the fibers are completely torn. We'll follow our way around the back of the shoulder and you'll see that there is certainly a partial thickness tear of this rotator cuff. Coming more posteriorly, we'll follow the rotator cuff all the way around the back of the humeral head. There's a normal little spot that doesn't have any cartilage there called the bare area. But the back, posterior aspect of the rotator cuff is fully intact. Now the ball of the ball and socket is next in our diagnostic exam. It should look like a white cue ball, and in fact it does. There's no signs of cartilage damage, potholes, or erosion of the cartilage. Another name for that type of damage would be osteoarthritis, and this shoulder does not have any osteoarthritis. Anteriorly is next. The anterior labrum in front of the biceps looks just fine. Behind that is the subscapularis muscle right there. That helps you internally rotate your arm and get it up the back of your spine. Coming down anteriorly along the anterior labrum, this is all intact. If you tear these muscles, these ligaments here, the shoulder is more likely to dislocate. So people that dislocate their shoulders tend to have a, have a detached labrum anteriorly in the shoulder. The next step is to do a rotator cuff debridement. We have a small five and a half millimeter shaver that we can insert through an anterior cannula and start to very carefully debride away the damaged tissue of the rotator cuff and get down to what is intact tendon. And there are intact fibers above this rotator cuff. As we debride the torn fragments of the rotator cuff, we can see intact fibers underneath it, right there. So that's a good sign. We're starting to clean this up a bit. A general rule of thumb amongst most shoulder surgeons is that if the rotator cuff is torn more than 50%, you need to repair it. If it's less than 50%, the remaining fibers usually function quite well, and they do not need to be repaired. Oftentimes that decision has to be made at the time of surgery when we can really measure the amount of tearing. In this patient, 
it's so far less than 50%. Now the second part of a diagnostic arthroscopy is with the arthroscope in the front of the shoulder. We're looking back across the shoulder with the ball up above and the socket down below. This structure right here is the labrum, the ring of tissue around the socket here. There's a little bit of degenerative fraying right here, but all in all, not bad. It's age appropriate. As people get older, their labrum degenerates a little bit, and they may have findings of labral tearing on an MRI scan when clinically it's not significant and it doesn't really cause pain. And if you were to, say, try to repair a degeneratively torn labrum, the shoulder can quite likely to get worse. We can see the ball moving back and forth. We can look up at the undersurface of the posterior aspect of the rotator cuff where we've just debrided a little bit. We can see that there's no full thickness tears there. We can come to the anterior aspect of the shoulder, look at the anterior labrum here, and come up the front of the shoulder until we can actually even see the subscapularis muscle, which is right here. It's got its own little pocket that it lives in down there. Make sure that that all looks quite normal, and it does. Now the next step to the next step to a diagnostic arthroscopy is to look into the bursal space or the subacromial space of the shoulder. It's up one level on the top side of the rotator cuff, so we can move the scope out and slide it up and into the subacromial space. Now the rotator cuff tendons are down below, and there is bone up above. Oftentimes people can have bone spurring on the acromion and require removal of that bone spur in order to free up impingement syndrome on the rotator cuff. In this patient, we're going to remove some of the subacromial bursitis. This is what bursitis looks like, this wispy, cobwebby type material in the subacromial space. It's not always there in every patient. It's usually developed as a result of an irritation in the shoulder. We can remove it and the shoulder will feel better. It can return if there's a new injury. This is a, this is what we call an arthroscopic shaver that has an oscillating blade and some suction similar to a Dremel type device. So we can control, by controlling the suction, how much of the bursitis and how much of the tissue comes into the jaws to be removed. This is only about five and a half millimeters wide, although on these cameras it looks much wider. You'll see as we debride the burst, it bleeds a little bit. It has some blood supply. It has some nerve supply. smooth it out like so. This is what we call a bursectomy. So just like we do in the glenohumeral joint, we put the arthroscope in both sides of the shoulder and we evaluate the subacromial space. The roof now is the acromion and namely it's covered right here by the coracoacromial ligament or the CA ligament. If people have significant impingement, this ligament is often very scuffed and frayed. There's mild scuffing here, but not too bad. This is a radio frequency device that we can use to cauterize any little bleeders that may be present after our bursectomy, such as right over here. And that will cauterize these small bleeders and make visualization easier for the surgeon. The next thing we'll look at is the bursal side, or the top side, of the rotator cuff. That's this tissue right here. We can see that there's no significant tearing on this side of the rotator cuff. So we can confirm that the maximum severity of this patient's rotator cuff tearing occurs in the articular side, within the joint, and is much less than 50%, so we will not require a rotator cuff repair. This is the top of the rotator cuff tendon. It begins with muscle over here medially, it turns into tendon, and then eventually it attaches to bone right here. 
vast majority of people with rotator cuff tears will have holes right in this area that we would be able to see right now. Now in this patient, we're going to do a small subacromial decompression, which means there's a little bit of bone spurring here on the acromion that can hang down and irritate the underlying rotator cuff, causing some bursitis formation on the top of the rotator cuff and causing some pain. So with our shaver, we're going to perform a subacromial decompression, which removes the bone and makes it flat. dig into the rotator cuff and cause any more impingement. This patient also has something called acromioclavicular joint arthritis, or AC joint arthritis. The end of the collarbone is right over here, and this area has been quite painful, and there does not have a lot of cartilage that's functional on it anymore. It's quite tender for the patient. So we're going to perform what we call a Mumford procedure, which is a excision of the distal one centimeter or so of the clavicle. Now for a distal clavicle excision, we use the same shaver and we'll slide it in between the bones of the acromion near us and the clavicle that's facing us, like so. We'll work our way across until we remove about 10 to 12 millimeters of bone here. This prevents the two arthritic surfaces from banging together and causing pain. It generally requires only about a week in a sling, but it can be still can still be sore and somewhat sensitive for two or three months. Here, if you look closely, you'll see a, a bone cyst right there at the end of the collarbone. That's a sign of osteoarthritis. And oftentimes correlates with pain. As we progress from anterior to posterior, we can see the removal of the bone. And now we've come all the way across the end of the collarbone. We'll try to leave these ligaments here intact. Now we've completed the excision of the distal clavicle. We've got plenty of room in here now. We pull back, we can look at the collarbone end on. And that's an appropriate resection. And we'll get this patient to recovery room and hopefully have a quick accelerated recovery. That's a diagnostic shoulder arthroscopy rotator cuff debridement, subacromial decompression, and distal clavicle excision.